Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Physical Therapy Private Practice Secrets of the Top 10%. And the overwhelming majority of physical therapy private practice owners who are starting practices are saying, I just want to start a practice with my PTs, DPTs, PTAs, and techs. I want to be a clinical provider. I want to have a clinical practice. And I'm going to, instead of, you know, diving into all the things I don't know, I'm going to bring experts in to handle the administrative side of my business. And I'm going to handle the clinical side. And I'm going to run a very well-balanced business so I can have work-life balance as an owner. If that is you. That is the progressive PT private practice model. And I'm here to share with you that that is a screaming success. And if you do it with a 20-80-20 hybrid breakdown, if you're still interested in building out bricks and mortar, that is what I would most lean into. So there you go. Tip number one, you can have your life. You can have work-life balance. You can, if you choose to think differently, you can actually have a successful private practice without the stress and without the 12 hour days. Um, there were, you know, what were there like two times in my life that I spent all night in my clinic and my wife had to bring me a change of clothes. Like I literally never went home. I stayed all night, did notes, did documentation. And she came in in the morning and was like, you're embarrassing me. And that was uh, something I don't wish on anybody. That is not what you should be doing. And work-life balance isn't just for your staff. It's for you too. So that's what this podcast is all about. How you can live the life of the practice owner that you deserve for yourself. And how can we help advance the profession of physical therapy? I am a big supporter of APTA, PPS, and everything else that goes around with it. So let's get into it. So number one, if in fact you're going to invest in the greatest CEO possible, guess what? That person is you. This is all about investing in you as the best CEO. You know, I, I would like to say, you know, reflect back on this, reflect on how much money you spent. Excuse me. I can, I, I can say that easily. Think about how much time, money, and effort you spent on getting your PT degree. Now think about how much time, money, and effort you've spent on becoming the best CEO of a physical therapy private practice, the best practice manager, the best financial director, the best comp controller, the best hiring and recruiting officer, the best compliance officer, because all of this stuff falls under your umbrella, right? This falls on you as the private. And let me tell you, don't be scared about that. Like literally when you were looking into the physical therapy program and you came in as a freshman and you started and you were like, oh my gosh, in four or five years, I'm going to actually be treating patients. It's all on me. I'm so nervous. There's so much to worry about. There's so much, you know, liability here. Yeah, that's true because it's all the unknown. It's all the mystery of what the competency level is that's required to deliver your physical therapy care to the level that you want it to in an exchange and abundance relationship with your patients, your community, your referral sources, and your staff. That's a broader viewpoint, right? You don't go into private practice thinking, I just want to have the best physical therapy care delivered and we're going to win. Mm. It's like saying I'm going to create a soccer team and I'm just going to have the world's best strikers and we're going to win. Meanwhile, your goalies, you know, got butterfingers. And your defense players are picking dandelions and whatever's going on. You're not going to win, right? There's multiple levels of objectives, of operational objectives that have to be met. And it's the CEO's job to sew it all together. So here's my message for this episode. Commit to investing in you becoming the best CEO possible for your practice, as well as as much as, I should say, or more than what you invested in in beginning your PT degree. It blows my mind that people spend $150,000, $200,000 in getting a piece of paper that gets you your PT degree and license for a seventy-five dollars to eighty-five dollars to 90000 depending on where you are in the country these days, your job. Meanwhile, you could, like with us, you could easily just go through Meg Academy's Platinum program for, you know, they're $2,500 programs. I mean, $2,500 program. You can go through and piece it together however you want, or you can buy the whole bundled, you know, platinum package for you and your staff. And it was, I'm not here to solicit that, but I'm just saying it's like, you know, ten, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000. I mean, it's a fraction, but yet you're going to make, you know, the average solo private practice owner in a 18 to 2,500 square foot office should absolutely be doing somewhere between 180 to 200 plus thousand dollars a year in exchange for the liability, risk, control, build out, structure, operations, everything that they've put in place. So going from a 90, let's say at a high side, 
$90,000 a year as a staff physical therapist. Maybe you're a clinical director. You're between 90 and 110, somewhere like that. I don't know. It depends on where you are in the country. It's all different. And you decide, I don't want to keep doing this because a snapshot today is going to be the same snapshot five years from now. And now I got two kids who are older in school, more economic liabilities. And what, my income went up maybe 5000 I mean, look, there's only so much your owner can pay you as a staff therapist, even as a clinical director, because Blue Cross is only going to pay so much. Medicare and Medicaid's like paying what it pays, right? There's nobody moving the needle and greatly increase the amount of reimbursement per visit. That is the crisis of our healthcare system, which thank goodness this election is over. And I don't care where you are on the spectrum, but we are on the cusp of change, or at least trying to have some changes so that we can like look at some of the flawed systems and make a difference. Why do I say that? Not to be political, but to be instructional. Isn't it time for us to look at the way in which we do physical therapy, private practice, and really start to re-examine. So tip for professional success, number number one, um, it's time to look. It's time to look. It's time to look for a, a change in model. It's time to look for a change in systematic approach. It's time to look for a change in management. And you're not going to get that if you don't get the training, if you don't get the schooling, if you don't get the skill development as a CEO, as an administrator, as a comp control officer, as a compliance officer, I am pleading with you, know what you need to know in advance of needing to know it. You know, the success rate we have with startup accelerator program with startup people who are like, yeah, I want to open up my own practice. I don't know if I should do mobile PT, cash base, hybrid base. Well, let's get the tools and the knowledge and the training of what it looks like and what it, and then it'll all come to you and you'll fill the holes of mystery and then you'll move forward with certainty. When you're certain about something, you'll move quick, swift, and you'll have confidence in what you're doing and you have greater belief in yourself. Tip for professional success number two, easy for me to say, time management. You have to master time management. If you're going to succeed in anything that you're going to do moving forward from here, you're a staff therapist and you want to go to clinical director, you want to go to owning your own practice, you want to become a junior partner, time management. I greatly recommend that you live on a Google calendar. You absolutely must block out blocks of administrative time in your week and blocks of personal time in your week and everything else is scheduled around that. If in fact you're doing this, you should not, in my opinion, if I go back over the 30 years I've been doing this and I look and observe at the most successful owners we've been working with, they do not treat more than 25 hours a week. They just do not. They have way too many other things to do. They need at least 10 to 15 hours a week of admin time and personal time. You know, you talk about work-life balance with staff, but guess what? You as an owner, you as a director, you as a manager, even more important. It's way more important, in my opinion, than a staff person who's clocking their time in, doing their stuff, and they go home. Because I tell you what, when they go home, they're not thinking about work. They're not thinking about, is the phone going to ring or how am I going to like make payroll or what money is going in reserves or what's the tax implications? I have to pay estimated taxes. Isn't that the most insane thing, by the way? Doesn't that make you want to rip your head off? You're literally paying estimated taxes on income you haven't even earned. I mean, think about what a screwed up system this is. It frustrates the heck out of me because I'm trying to help you be successful. The more successful you are, the more successful I am because I take great pleasure in seeing you succeed and contributing to you living the life you deserve. But yet the government has these things in place that are just literally obstacle, 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 hurdle, hurdle, hurdle. But anyways, I'm here to help you get around those hurdles. I'm here to say, first and foremost, you need to focus on time management. Put in blocks of personnel time, put in blocks of admin time and schedule everything else around it. Try not to treat more than 25 hours a week if you're a, a, a practice owner. Now, in the beginning, you're like, well, Brian, in the first 12 to 18 months, yeah, first 12, 18, 24 months, you're going to be trading 40 hours a week, probably more. But you're going to scale it down to 35 and then down to 30. And you want to get down to like 28 to 25 hours a week. My, my, my established clinic owners are not treating more than 20 hours a week. They're like down there. And then they're really working the business, not working in the business, they're working on the business. Um, in order to do that, if you're going to work on the business, it's, you know, tip for professional success. Number three, you have to live by the numbers. Uh, it's all about the numbers, people. It's 
all about the numbers. Management by statistics. And so what do I mean by that? There are about 54 key statistics that you absolutely need to know if you're going to run a successful private practice. Now, I can alter those, so don't hold me to that 54 number, um, because if you're a mobile PT practice, it kind of shifts. If you're a hybrid practice, it shifts. If you're a cash-based practice, it shifts. Um, there are changes there. Uh, so absolutely commit yourself to the numbers and knowing what the primary stats are that actually generate change and the substats that drive the primary stats. Because the ones that you work on, the products that you do, the action plan that you write for yourself and for your staff on a weekly basis are to drive the substats up. It's the accumulation of the substat accomplishments that actually drive the primary stat. So for instance, if your primary statistic is new patients, I want to go from averaging 10 evals a week in my clinic to averaging 15 evals a week in my clinic, you're not going to drive around with a magic wand and tap people in the head and make them new patients. You don't make new patients. You develop them through the substats. You ask yourself, well, what's our SEO sta standing in, in the Google search? Are we on the first page? Are we at the top of the first page? What's our you know likes in the following on Google or in LinkedIn or on our TikTok videos or an Instagram account? You know, are you tracking that? You're like, what is that? Um, how many lunch and learns have you done? Still effective, not in every part of the country, but honestly, people like to do business with those that they know, like, and trust. So what are you doing to be known? What are you doing out in your community and with your referral sources to be well-liked? And what are you doing to breed trust? I hope I communicate trust with you just through this podcast and through my other channels, because that's all I live for right now is thriving on the statistical success rate of your practice, of your, you know, quality of life, if you will. That to me is everything. It's not great if your practice is making a million dollars a year and you don't have a life and you're now divorced and your kids hate you and your dog doesn't even like bother to come up to you when you come home. If that's happening, we're way off track. Like that's not what this is about at all. So when I have revenue numbers, it's about giving you some some peace, right? Some some balance. Um, I just recently watched a YouTube video on the top 10 states not to live in because of the cost of living. And you know, they were crazy. I mean, it was insane. Some of these taxes and stuff. So, anyways, I, I digress. I'm not going to get into that. But you're probably living, maybe some of you are living in one of those top 10 states and they're saying you need to average $126,000 a year per individual just to thrive in this, in the worst state in the country, which I'm not going to name because I don't want to offend anybody. But knowing your key performance indicators, again, knowing your numbers, super, super important. What numbers do you need to know? Payroll is a percent of gross income. What's that looking like on a monthly basis? What's your payroll as a percent of gross income? What about your GI, your gross income, divided by staff on a weekly basis? How's that falling? Do you know the scale of fair, good, excellent, you know? You should know that. And then you should have a plan, like I said, to run the substats of how to make that work, right? How to get that primary statistic up. GI divided by staff is definitely a primary statistic. So whether you're overstaffed or you're underproducing, both of those are going to drive that down or drive it up. And so what do we do to not be overstaffed and how do we overproduce? I claim, and I'm going to give you a secret tip here, which is not even on my sheet. I claim the more the owners are able to focus on their brand, quality of outcome, staff satisfaction, and clinical development. Like literally being seen as an expert in the clinical realm. I don't care if you have 20 clinics within five miles of you. If you're deemed the one who's using innovative technology, maybe you're using the newbie, super, super good. I can't, I've been talking about it for years and every owner that I've, 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 I've ever put it in the hands or ever encouraged them, they, they end up buying more than one. I mean, it's like some high percentage in the 90s that if they buy one, they're going to buy more than one because it's so dang effective. And it's so good for the patients, for the practice, for the community. There's other equipment out there too. There's other wonderful pieces of innovative technology um, that you should be employing in your practice. And of course, we can talk about that if you wish. Know your data in terms of visits to break even. I think that's another very important point too. What is your cost per visit? Sorry, if you guys see me looking down at my paper, I want to make sure I I hit these note points, these bullet points for you because they're so, so valuable. Many, many owners that reach in and I do coaching calls every single week, like five to seven a week all the time. And, you know, for all my Meg clients who are in Meg Academy or maybe we're doing billing for them or we're doing virtual front desk or the rage, the, the rage of the street right now is 
who can do the best insurance verification of benefits and the insurance authorizations. And we are <laughs> polishing that. We're polishing that nickel every day to make sure that we're the best of the rest in doing that. But my point on that is you should be able to know what is your cost in delivering a physical therapy session, a visit. Super important. Now, let's move off of these tips for professional success. I think I've given you several here that are takeaways. And if you want more details on them, it's free to call me. Just go to the website and schedule a session and we'll talk about your practice, where you're at and what you can do moving forward. Most importantly, I guess, if you do reach in and you do call me, be prepared. The first thing I'm going to ask you is what's your ideal scene? It's less important for me to know well, it's important for me to know, but it's less important in the overall picture of things for me to know where you're standing right now today. That's kind of less important because no matter where you're standing today, if I don't know where you want to go, if I don't know where Disneyland is for you or where your favorite vacation spot is, how am I going to roadmap out your gas station stops, your hotel stays, you know, what you need to pack the car with? You see what I'm saying? People are so focused on where they are and, and planning their next step, their next step wrong answer. <laughs> I'm sharing with you right now in terms of our highest level of executive training and our CEO program as not what you would learn. What you would learn is, well, paint for me what the absolute ideal scene for you is. The rose is the white picket fence, the square footage of the home. What is it? And then well, what would we need to have to get to that? And then we talk about that page, that picture, if you will. What would we need to get there? And then we talk about that one. So you see, it's a matter of working backward from what you really want in life. If you really want, which I think all of us do, freedom, we want freedom. Would you need to have financial stability that matches time flexibility? Think about that. This is my growth for professional success. This is my growth for personal success. I keep mess messing those words up. It's our GPS now, growth for personal success, right? Tips for professional success are the ones we just did. Your personal success here is freedom work-life balance, having financial stability that pairs up with time flexibility, which is why I don't want you treating more than 25 to 28 hours a week, no matter what the size is in your practice, which is why I want you to know your numbers so we can drive profit margins, which is why you need to know what the cost per visit is. Which contract should I ditch? Let me tell you, if you have a contract and you're not making a margin of 15 or greater, $15 or greater on that visit, don't do it. Like, don't do it. Let that garbage pail go to somebody else. These insurance companies need a smacking wake-up call. This is ridiculous. I have owners calling me up and say, yeah, this insurance company is paying me $37.50. I'm like, and you're doing it? Wow, we tried to double. There's no amount of doubling them up that's going to make that work. And there's no amount of good quality care that's going to happen from the doubling up. I'm not, a fan. I'm not saying you can't cross over patients 10 or 15 minutes. That's not the problem. Bringing in three patients on the hour... And thinking that's okay, I don't know. I have a problem with that. I don't, I don't know how you guys feel about that. But I just wanted to communicate that. GPS number two. This one is so mainstream for me, but I started talking about it just a few weeks ago and owners were like, wow, I've never heard that before. Like, that's new messaging for me. That really takes some of the pressure off. And it's this concept. Have a little grace. Have some grace for the staff that you hire and the people you're hiring. You're hiring millennials and zennials. And for those of you that are Gen Xers, it's a different culture. Not a bad culture. I'm not down. I'm not being critical and complaining. I'm just saying they're coming in at a certain level, at a certain point, with certain considerations that didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. And so you have to be able to handle those considerations and give them a little grace. The word on the street is, <laughs> of course, I'm the one telling you about the street, the word on my street, I should say, is simply this. I would like to coach you to have an 85% tolerance level. When you make a tool in a machine shop, there's something called a tolerance. Like that screw can only be within 0.001 millimeters off from perfect in order for it to fit in the hole that it has to go in, right? So there's a certain tolerance that every single thing is manufactured at. Well, you're manufacturing a successful physical therapy practice. You're doing that through personnel. You're not, you know, lathing screws and bolts. You're hiring quality staff that you love and encourage to have an enriched life working for you or working with you, right? So to do that, where do you draw the line? You draw the line at 85%. 85%. Anyone that you hire that can do 85% of perfect is a keeper, not a sweeper. 
They're a keeper. You keep that person and you tolerate the fact that there's a 15% margin where things won't always go perfectly well. I mean, I know I service hundreds of your offices in billing and virtual front desk and insurance verifications, authorizations. I take that pressure off of you. But I tell you, we're not perfect. There's no way. I'm dealing with human beings like you're dealing with human beings. We'll give you greater stability. We'll give, give you greater confidence, greater security, greater professional care. We don't have to learn it. We know it. So you don't have to deal with the turnover. At the, anyways, I can go off in so many different directions. But I have a tolerance level of my staff being 85% perfect. You should embrace that as well. It takes the pressure off you getting frustrated like, Look, I know you could do it better. I know you could do it. You're like, oh, man, I would have done it that way. Like, why didn't you do that? I feel like I'm adult babysitting. I'm like, "Uh, cut that out. You know, cut that out. Stop that. Change that mindset. That is not where you want to be. You want to embrace that person and lift them up through your encouragement, through your education, through your enhancement, through your mentorship, through your personal and professional communication and support. That's what makes a successful practice. It's about people. It's about your people. It's about you and others and people you work with, the people you connect yourself with. Always be willing to look. I talked about this earlier as a GPS, as a growth, um, as a person, personal growth uh, success, you know, growth for personal success, however you want to say it. Uh, I keep flipping back and forth because I like both. Um, don't be afraid of change. That's what I'm trying to say here. Don't be afraid of change. You know, you have to be willing to look at your systems and maybe throw out the box. Don't think outside the box. Get rid of the box and do it completely different. But have a sounding board. Have somebody of knowledge, education, and authority and experience in the field to bounce things off of, to coach. That's kind of where I kind of see myself. I don't see myself as a consultant. Ugh, I don't want to be somebody who gives you a bunch of bright ideas, gets a big check, and leaves. I, ugh, that's not. Coach, Coach enables you to perform at a level that you never would have performed at before. And that's what I'm always thinking and going work. That's what's always being upgraded, updated, and enhanced in tools, materials, videos, content, role play, exams, quizzes, tests. In Mech Academy, I pump all of that in there so that you walk away with skill development in this area and you can challenge yourself by not being afraid of what you're trying to accomplish in this practice. And that goes back to my earlier statement on a TPS know your ideal scene. You absolutely have to know your ideals. And for those of you who want to do startup, I will help you develop your ideal scene. And then we will stay on a 27 step approach to get you up and running and break even within six months of swinging your doors in, doors open. And within 12 months, you are a viable, profitable practice year one. I will not accept anything less than that. It has to be that. Last but not least, I just recently finished a Netflix series. It was a three- uh, season series called Afterlife. I don't know if anybody's seen that. Um, I was really moved by it. The first season, I had to watch the whole season because the first four or five, I wanted to stop. I was like, this is too depressing. Like, this is not doing it for me. But then once I got through the first season, I said, wow, this is some real character development. There's some real message here. And the message is, keep your eye on the ball. Keep your eye on what's important in life in your life, in the life of those around you. It's not always all about you. It's not always all about what's important to us. Because what's important to me, I can tell you, is seeing my wife laugh and have a good time and know that she feels safe, secure, and happy is more joy and pleasure to me than anything I could possibly have her give me. By me seeing my children winning in life and socially well-mannered and thriving in what they're doing because of my encouragement, support, and time and presence is the greatest gift they could ever exchange back with me. And I feel the same way about my employees. With 130 staff in 43 different states, I literally call, text, email people all the time. How are you doing? How's it going? How's the new position treating you? How are you feeling about it? Any words of advice for me to do it on how I can do it better and how we can do it better and how we can actually do it more efficiently, how we can help people more? What are the problems that you see that maybe I'm overlooking? Everybody has a seat at the table. In that movie, the very end, the very last episode, it it should move you. It should move you because it really does get you to land on happiness is not a independent game. It's not a solo action. 
it's really a collaboration and a connection with everybody you have around you. So I'll end on that note. I, I found it very positive, very uplifting. You won't be depressed at the end. You will be like, wow, you know, I need to look at my life and I need to really think about those who are in my life and what I can do in a most positive nature for everyone involved. And you can. That's why you're going into private practice. That's why you want more because you are blissfully discontent. And so you want to live to the fullest of your DNA and have the optimum life experience, both in personal life and in your professional life. And I hope I can be a part of helping you achieve that. So that's what these podcasts are going to all be about. I'm going to stick to this agenda. We're going to go bullet point by bullet point, tips for professional success and personal growth ideas, you know, personal BGIs, personal growth ideas. So we're going to stick on that nomenclature, all right? Personal growth ideas and tips for professional success coming at you every single week. Thank you guys for listening and start every day expecting to do well.